All right. So watermark, for those of you that have ever been online, if, if you, and I, and I know many of you probably haven't, if, you, if you've ever been online and you search pictures, if you ever search pictures online, what you're doing research, um, you will find that uh, some of those photos that you searched online has these marks on it. They will have the author signature. They will have maybe a stock signature. They, you can put this on maybe documents. Some of you, maybe if you're using documents, legal documents, there is, you may see a, a, a symbol or emblem of something. Uh, for us, Calvary, we have our own logo watermarked within our documents, stressing that it's ours, meaning no one can steal it. No one can steal it. So uh, uh, painters and, and creatives, those who, photographers, the, if they put their stuff out in public, they will make sure they watermark it. Because a lot of people can go online and steal your stuff. Are you with me? Not only that, but when you have documents, when I watermark my document and I bring it to, let's say, the Federal Bureau of whatever, it's once they see that it is watermarked and it's stamped with my name on it, that nobody can copy it, nobody can steal it, it's marked. Does that make sense? And though they hold it in their hand, Although they have it in their hand, there's nothing that they can do to take the, the mark that I placed on it off. Some of you are already getting what I'm trying to get at. When you are baptized by God, God marks you. And no matter how much the pub, you go out in public, it is a public sign that you have been marked by God. And so one of the first things about baptism is that it is a public sign that you have been marked. Are you with me, somebody? It, it, it is public. It is no longer private that you have God in your life, that when you are now baptized, it is now you are publicly saying, I believe God. Are you with me? All right. Let, let's, let's do scripture for you. If you've just read Matthew 28, you, you've read at the end of Matthew 27, it's a sad time. And so if you take the time to read Matthew 27, that you, you read uh, Jesus has, is, is, is dead. Jesus is dead. Uh, his disciples who have spent their life, the three years of their life, following their master, their teacher. Now they are afraid and distraught because the person who they love is now gone. Matthew 27. Matthew 28, everything changed. We have a song we say, but that's not how. The story ends. In three days, he rose again. Praise be to God, Matthew 28, the, the story of Jesus' death is changed. He is now, Mary and Martha is now going to his tomb to go do a burial kind of customs. And when they are on their way there, an angel tells them, the person you seek, Jesus is alive. Yeah. That, that the, the, the God, the, the, your master that you seek, he is risen. And brothers and sisters, now what we have here is now they are now so excited. And the angel says, don't just keep this to yourself. Go tell your disciples. Go tell the disciples, Jesus is alive. Tell your neighbor, say, Jesus is alive. Yeah. But in that same passage of scripture, you will find that they paid, the leaders of, of that time paid the soldiers to say the disciples stole the body. 
if you didn't know. Jesus is risen. One group believes. One group denies. Because one of the things I want you to say, want to tell you this morning, is that when Jesus is risen, it, 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 it pushed out two responses. Either you believe it or you deny it. And how many, and I think since you're sitting here today, you believe Jesus is alive. Let, let, me, let, me, just, let me just take a, I believe, raise your hands, I believe Jesus is alive. That he is risen. Oh, thank you, Brother Bryce. Bryce, raise his hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so the response is now that he's alive and that now, here's what happens when our Story picks up in verse number 16. The 11 is seeing Jesus for the first time. Just saw him die. And now it's 11, they see him for the first time. And although Jesus, they see Jesus, some of the disciples are still doubting. And instead of Jesus talking to their doubt, he speaks to their faith. I know you're doubting, I know you're fearful, but here's what I want you to do. This is what we call the Great Commission. All right? Are y'all listening to me? This is what you call the Great, somebody say Great Commission. Right? Those that are getting baptized, it's called the Great Commission. He says, go into all the world. I'm alive and well, go and baptize. Now, this is not the last, this is not, you know, it's, it's not great because it's the last thing Jesus says. Jesus says something after this too. It's, it's, it's not great because of just the command of it. it. It's great because it's a response to one that you know Jesus is alive. There is a great response that all of us should give God, once we know he's alive, we give him our life, we give him everything. Are you with me? And so first thing that I want to give you for baptism in this great, in this great commission, the first thing that you need to know about baptism, it, it's a command. Baptism is commanded. Put that in there. Baptism is commissioned. All right. Just in case some of you are saying, I don't know. Can you go to heaven without being baptized? Yes. But there's more to your salvation. There's access that you get through. That comes through baptism. It is a command. Somebody say a command. Now I know that might not be enough for you. But if Jesus is your savior. If Jesus is your Lord. If he tells you to do something. That should be good enough. Okay, because I know we're living in a generation, not even a generation, we're living with people right now, when you tell them something to do, they say why. That you need a reason. Some of you are like that too. If I say, if I say, <laughs> move down. <laughs> if I say move down a few seats, you say why. <laughs> because baptism is a form of obedience. Are you with me? Are you, are you with me? Those, especially those that are getting baptized. If you're getting baptized, baptism, thank you. I'm, I'm really want to talk to you more than the, the older saints. I want to make sure I, I get this so that you can understand more than anything. I want you to understand baptism. What it is and what it ain't. It's a command. Jesus says, go baptize. And if Jesus says, go baptize, because Jesus said it, and I trust Jesus, I'm going to do it. Does that make sense? It's a command. Somebody say command. 
And so when we picked it up, he commands his disciples, go make disciples. And you make disciples by baptism. I know you are a disciple of Jesus Christ because you are baptized. Anybody want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Oh, I, I, I love your enthusiasm. Brooke, I, 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 Brooke and, 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 and uh, Bailey are faithfully, Blakely, I'm sorry, are faithfully, every, everything I say, man, Lord have mercy. It's a command. Somebody say command. <laughs> Baptism is commissioned and commanded by Jesus. And because Jesus says it, that's enough for me. The one who has all authority says get baptized. The one with all authority says be baptized. So then I must be baptized. Are you with me, somebody? If you turn your Bibles to Matthew 3, verse 13, and again, I know you may look for enthusiasm, but this is, I got to take my time today. Matthew 3, verse 13. Matthew 3, verse 13 to 15. Matthew 3, put that in your notes. Matthew 3, verse 13. 13 through 15. Matthew 3, 13 Matthew 3, you found it? You found it? You got it? All right. Then Jesus came to Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John tried to deter him. John tried to deter him. We'll talk about why. I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, verse 16, he went up out of the water and at that moment, Heavens open. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning around him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love and is well pleased. Now, what makes this what makes this amazing? Jesus is sinless. The only person. To walk the faith of the earth that was perfect was Jesus. I know some of you think that, you know, the only person. And Jesus says, it's important for me, even though I'm perfect, to be baptized. Okay, I want to make sure I slow down so you can understand. Jesus is, somebody say perfect. Jesus is sinless. He can cause anybody no problem. He can give his, his, his friends you no know, headache. He, he had no friction between human beings and God. There was peace on both sides. And Jesus says, I need to be baptized. And so here's the standard. If perfect Jesus... Needed to be baptized? You with your flaws. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Just in case, since, since you may not, since you probably didn't agree with it was a command. You know, I know some of you say, oh, I, I can't get with just a command. But what about when I look at my life? I'm not perfect. And yet Jesus says, no, you need to baptize me. I, I need this baptism to fulfill all righteousness. And John is saying, no, 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 no. Somebody like you, I should be coming to you. You baptize me. Jesus says, no, baptize me. 
Because he, Jesus understands, baptism is necessary. Lord have mercy. I know some of you might say, oh, okay, I may not, I may not need it. I can, I can make it through. I can make it to heaven by just being saved because they use the thief on the cross. But what I want you to show, what I want to show you, if, if Jesus saw the need in being baptized, then we ought to have that same. Are you with me? Perfect. And, and, and not only that, but if you have your Bibles again, Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. And this is what I'm trying to do. This is not only for those of us in here that's going to be baptized on Saturday. This is for you believers too. When somebody asks you why you're baptized. What's the, why it's so important. It's important because Jesus commanded it. It's important because I'm, I'm copying Jesus. You found it? You found Ephesians 5, 1 to 2? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you out there to read it. Let me, I'm going to call somebody to read. Let me, Ephesians 5. You found it? Okay, you good. Ephesians 5. Come on, Blakey. Wait, hold on. Say it again. Pause right there for a second. Watch what God does. And then guess what? Watch what God does. You do it. Do what God does. Go ahead, keep going. We'll get back to this. That's a Greek Bible. What, 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 what version is that? No, that can't be something different. That's Message? It is? Wow. Man, that was... Thank you. Thank you, Sister Blakely. That is amazing. Love like God loved. Imitate. Be imitators of Christ. And why this is important is if Jesus was baptized then we should imitate what he did. Every day of your life, your job as disciples is to be like Christ. And, 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 amen? Every single day of my life, I'm trying to be more and more like Christ. I'm going to, whatever, what he ate, I want to eat. Anybody got any mentors? Any, any mentors? Anybody have mentors? No. I see one, two. You got a mentor? All the saints, y'all no y'all no mentors? Oh God, poor T. Poor T. Did you have did you have a mentors before? Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking to all the saints. You have a mentor? 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 Yes? Anybody? So did you talk to anybody? Who you talk to? Just Jesus? Yeah, or have you, yeah, mentor people, but have you been mentored by somebody? Okay. <laughs> I mean, that works too. I mean, there's still, there's mentor, there, there is men, mentorship that goes back and forth. But one thing about mentorship is not just level of wisdom, it's experience. They, they travel the road that I haven't traveled yet. And their experience keep me from making the same mistakes they did. They'll say, man, in, in, in 72, this is what I did. You don't do this. That, that, that's what makes mentorship 
So, and then when you have a mentor, especially if, if you look up to them. See, mentorship only work if you look up to them and you trust what they have to say. It don't work. It, it, it don't work if you, if, if you don't trust what they have to say and you're not willing to listen. Be, because then you lose out on valuable information. And so, listen, those that are getting baptized, find yourself a mentor that you can trust to keep you from making the mistakes after baptism. Because I'm, I'm sure we, we're going to hear some stories, the after baptism life. Are you with me? And so what happens is if you love Jesus, then you do what he did. That's what it means to be imitators. I know, I, want, I know we talk about, I want you to have love like Christ and peace like Christ and joy like Christ. But I also want to do what he did. I want to talk to people the same way he talked to people. It's not just the spiritual, it's not just the spiritual aspect of Jesus' life that I'm trying to imitate. I'm also looking at how he talked to people. Wait, hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. I don't, I, the, per, the reason why I didn't want to make baptism just about something spiritual, I wanted to capture the physical part of it too. Because some of us only think about the spiritual, what it's doing to our spirit. Of course baptism have a spiritual side, but there's a physical side too. I love that Jesus submitted to John, knowing that he was greater than him, but because he needed to be baptized, he could have said, I'm going to baptize myself. That I don't need for you to baptize me. But he walked to the water with John and says, I'm going to humble myself. Baptism is humility. I'm going to humble myself. And although I got more power than you, and I know more than you, and I'm the son of God. I'm going to yield to your power so that you can be baptized. Because baptism is not about you, it's about the power of God. Are you with me? I'm trying not to preach this thing. I want, I want to teach it as much. So when you get baptized, Blakely, it's, it's you submitting to God. I'm surrendering all control to you. Because I want to, watch this, be just like Jesus. Kajer, that's what you're saying. I want to be just like Jesus. I, I want to do exactly what he did. That's why he walked the earth. He walked the earth. He came in flesh so that you can watch, Shiloh, how he interacted with people. We get, see, the miracle, I know miracles are amazing. I'm, I'm Forgive me for sidetracking. Y'all yeah, mind if I sidetrack just a little, Noah? Miracles are amazing. The miracles of Jesus Christ are amazing. Turning turn uh, five, five, five fish and two low, two low, five fish, feeding 5,000. That's amazing. Anybody? That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, healing blind eyes. How many want to do that? Right? It, it's amazing. You don't want to do that? <laughs> raising, raising, raising Lazarus from Noah? Uh, uh, amazing. Max, the, uh, healing deaf ears. Amazing. You know what's amazing too? Seeing a wo woman at the well and talking to her. Amazing. You, you know what's good too, Taj? He sees somebody, he sees a child, he sees children that people are rejected, and he said, suffer the little children. To come on to me. He see people that's rejected. And he stops and say. Don't talk about them. Your greatest miracles. Are not sometimes opening blind eyes. But sometimes just stopping and listening to somebody. And if we take that time. To stop. And have some humility. And be humble and talk to somebody else. 
I, I want you to, when you are studying, when you're studying, don't study the miracles. Study how Jesus talked to people. I want to be baptized so I can talk to people like Christ. Study how after he left the scene, how, uh, how everything got better for that person. I, I want you to study the social aspect of Jesus' life. Not just the spiritual. I want to make sure you understand. I don't want you to study just the miraculous. I want you to study the common, everyday Jesus. Because that's why you are baptized. You know why? You're getting baptized, and not every day is going to be a miracle. Not every day you're going to open blind eyes. But every day you can be nice. Every day you can be kind. Every day you can be humble. Every day you can submit to the power of God. Every day you can, you can speak to somebody, although your day might be going great. Not be, it's not going great, but you still can make somebody's life better. He, he humbled himself. Max, he had more power than John. John was telling him, Jesus, I, I can't baptize you. It's like you, it's like me coming to you, Max, and say, Max, baptize me. And you say, Uncle Stephen. Uncle Stephen, you want me to baptize you? And I'm saying yes, because I see the importance not only in being humble, but I understand how much you need baptism. With me so far? Okay, so baptism is a command. Because Jesus said to do it, I'm going to do it. And I want to, watch this, I want to copy Jesus. I want to copy him. That's what Ephesians says, be imitators. Make sense? So far, what you, got, what you got in your nose? Baptism is a command. Baptism is copying Jesus. Amen so far? All right. So I need you now, turn your Bibles to Romans 6. Romans 6. Verses, uh, we're going to read up to the, first, the fourth verse, one through four. All right? And again, I'm asking you to read, not me, because, again, I realize when I start talking and, and it's quiet, all of a sudden I start seeing people saying yes in the spirit. You know, you know what that means? Yeah. Amen. Found it? You found it? Romans 6, verses 1 to 4. Just in case. I see that face. That face is... Let me tell you again. Romans 6. Romans 6. Any volunteers before I, I blindly pick someone? Anybody want to volunteer Romans 6, 1 to 4? Romans 6, 1 to 4. All right. What shall we say?
Thank you. All right. So, so far, I've, get, I've given you the physical. Baptism is a command. Baptism is copying Jesus. Now I want to give you the spiritual aspect. What baptism, the significance of baptism. You and I, we have a sin nature problem. Okay? There's something wrong with our nature. Paul says, when I want to do good, okay, let me talk to the young, let me talk to the young people. He says, I recognize there's something wrong with me in my, my nature. You know what your nature means? You, you know your nature? Okay. I, your nature? Your, the core of who I am. The core of who you are, Taja, we have a sin problem. I want to do good, but evil shows up. Have you ever said, I'm going to do the right thing, but then instead of doing the right thing, you did the wrong thing? Hands in the air. Yeah, hands in the air. That, that my nature, by nature, I want to do the right thing, but all of a sudden in doing the right thing, I had a good thought. I want to apologize. I'm going to live right. I'm going to obey what my mother said. And then the time came and the opposite happened. Paul, Paul says, and not only Paul, um, the Bible been from the Old Testament says we have a, a, a nature problem that we was conceived. That, that when Adam and Eve fell, when our mothers and father fell in the, in the garden, they passed on to us a nature that was separated from God. Nothing I can do to walk into the presence of God because of my nature of sin. Are you with me so far? Amen? There is a sin problem. Somebody say sin problem. There is a nature problem. And so the Bible then, now Paul is saying, what, what shall we say then? The first three chapters, he's talking about all the issues that's happening with sin. Shall you keep singing, sinning when grace abounds? Now, what I love about this, he's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the saved folk. Because, can I tell you something, um, um, Taj, Noah, Max, save folk. Your baptized uncles and aunts and mentors, sin. Okay, we, we, your cousins, your aunties, Mentors, they have a sin problem. And can I tell you something? And the sooner we admit it. Okay, so, so all the saints, young saints, middle-aged saints, sin. I don't care how much they cover it up and dress it up and walk down the aisle here. Sin problem. Somebody say sin problem. He said, so, so what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin when grace abounds? Meaning, when God has covered us, can, why do we keep doing wrong when God has covered you? So the nature problem that we had, you and I couldn't do it ourselves, and so he sent his son Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. I could not save myself, so he sent his son to save me, to take care of my nature problem. Now, here's what I need you to know. Although we sin, sin doesn't have the power over us. Okay? I, I want to make sure... 
So after this, and I'm, I'm sorry to keep picking on you, Taja and Shiloh, you're going to sin. You're going to mess up. And that's not an indictment. That's not me coming down on you hard. That's letting you know, although you mess up, you have the power over that mess up. That it doesn't have the strength to keep you down. Because of what Jesus did for you, I wish I had somebody. See, this is why I need, I need those of you church folk who knows I used to mess up, but the power that it has is not the same way anymore. Lies, I used to lie a lot, but the power of lies don't work in my life anymore. Somebody say power. power. Yeah. There, there was a sin problem. And God sent his son, Jesus, because we couldn't do it for ourselves. Amen? And so now baptism, watch this. You know, how many know Easter? The cross, the burial, and resurrection. Right? That's what we do at Easter time. That's what we do, okay? It is the cross, the burial, and resurrection. Baptism now, you come into identify with Christ. That my baptism is, watch this, it's my cross, it's my burial, and my resurrection. Baptism is your ID card. When I say show you my identity, this is how you identify. You become like Jesus Christ when you get baptized. Because now you identify with his cross, the burial, and resurrection. So watch this. I know you may not believe it. When you go down into that pool on, on Saturday, you're going to be doing the same thing Christ did when he was on his cross. When we went to the tomb and when he rose from the dead. Do you realize that? That's what it is. Now, when somebody asks you, you wasn't, you know, you wasn't there when Christ was on the cross and you wasn't there when he got buried. You wasn't there when he was resurrected. You was like, I wasn't there, but I went through the same thing. Water baptism makes me connected with Christ. It's my cross. It's my burial. And it's my resurrection. Yes, watch this. It is a cleansing, but it's more than a cleansing. I know many of us says baptism, and many of you, when you look at the water, you say baptism is washing me. It's doing more than washing you. You are coming in symbolically through the power of God. It's nothing in the water. It's the God of that water. When you get in that water, the same thing we talk about on Easter, about Christ died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and came up for new life. When you go down in the water, you die. Yeah. Max, when, you, when we dipped you in that water, the old Max dies. Noah, when we dip you, that old Noah dies. And when we pull you up, there's a new Max. There's a new Noah. There's a new Taja. There's a new Shiloh. Because all things are passed away. Okay, okay. When, when Jesus came up out of that tomb and he was resurrected, that was a new Jesus with all authority. I wish I had somebody in here. 
it, it, it's now, it's not merely removing sin. Baptism don't remove, remove sin. It reveals your heart. That water can't take anything off you. God did that already. Christ did that already. But what it is doing is transforming your heart. I wish I had some. Anybody in here know how your heart is transformed when you get down in that water? And when he pulls you up, all things are past. Turn your Bibles with turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5. 14 to 24. Yeah. If, if you have it, again, this is where somebody else reads. Second Corinthians, let me pull out my, sorry. Five, fourteen, through. Got it? Okay. You want to read it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> to twenty-one. Your baptism is a burial. But your baptism is also a wedding ceremony. I know, get that imagery in your head. I know it's kind of weird. It, it is a burial. It is the funeral. But also it is where you, com you know, you, for those of you that know uh, um, um, funerals, they say you commit the body. But also, it is a wedding. Because this is where we get married to God. We come up as his bride. Where now, i am committed my old ways. I've laid it in the grave. I've pushed it aside. And now, I've come up in the newness with new giftings. New ideas. When, do you realize when you start opening your life to God, when you start giving God more space, it, it's, it's not that God gives you more, you know, some of us think that, that each time we walk with God, he's giving us more power. No, what I am, I'm, I'm emptying myself. Power comes from the more space I give God is the small power he gives me. Okay, one more time. It, your power comes from giving God more space. You want to see powerful people? People that empty themselves. God ain't going to put power on mess. And some of you are praying for power, and God is not going to empower a mess. You got to empty yourself. Well, I'm, I'm preaching to myself in here. This is not just about this is not just about the new converts. It's about some of us who have been baptized already. That that you allow your old self to show up too much. 
that you, you are still living in the graveyard trying to dig up your old ways. And Christ is here to tell you, you, have a, you are a new creature. Slap your neighbor and say, I'm new. Find somebody that says, I'm new. Water baptism, water can't change you. Jesus can. And when you go down into that water, baptism is believing. Baptism is giving God a promise that you're going to serve him with your life. Baptism is saying all of my giftings, all of my talents, I'm going to use them to serve you with it. Is that an amen? Amen? Baptism is a command. Baptism, you're copying. Baptism, you are committed, you are identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is service. I'm going to serve God with my life. That when I go down into that water, old Stephen dies. New Stephen is raised. Now, we're going to spend some time and talk about after baptism. I, I want some, this is what we normally do before baptism service. I mean, right, well, we, we have a testimony service. And we talk to those who've been baptized. And I want those of you, again, who have been baptized to tell your after baptism testimony. Your struggles. Your victories. What I will tell you before anybody else, baptism is not a feeling. You never feel worthy. Because I know some of you right now are thinking, am I worthy to be baptized? I got too much stuff going on in my life. Baptism is not about what I feel, it's what I believe. Can I tell you that? Because there are going to be times what you feel contradicts what you believe. You're going to feel terrible, but you got to believe that I'm saved. You're going to feel like you lost, but you got to believe and know I already won. You're going to feel dirty, but you got to believe and know I'm being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I feel like I lost it all, but I believe and I know God is holding it together. And if, where's the witnesses in there? I'm just talking to myself. That when your, belief, your feelings contradict your belief, this is not what I feel, it's what I know. I know that God is a deliverer. So even though I'm stuck and I feel stuck, I know I've already been delivered. That, that's necessary Young folk to know. Because sometimes you won't feel like a Christian. You won't feel saved. You won't feel like your baptism did anything. And I'm here to tell you, it's not what you feel, it's what you know. I know I've been changed. Oh, do I have any witnesses in here? I, I know. I know I've been changed. The reason, why you, the reason why you agreed to be baptized is not because of what your mother, father pushed. It's what you believe. Your belief said it's time. It was enforced. And so that's what happens when you go down in the water. When you come up, I mean, there's amazing stories. I could tell you some of mine. Anybody want to share their testimony? Hopefully, we, we, anybody want to share their testimony? Hopefully, we do have some. Let me tell you mine. Let me, let me tell you my testimony. I tell it all the time. I baptized. Baptized at, I think it was uh, 12, 13. 
And when I was baptized, man, I thought I was going to change the world. I say the same thing all the time. I got a bag. I got a pocket full of tracks. And I ran around my whole neighborhood putting it in their mailbox. Stephen was going to change the world. Yeah, I was going to change it. Went around all in my neighborhood. That's when living at 1290, I, I didn't use my, <laughs> I didn't go in my block. So say, you know, I didn't do my block. I went on East 34th. I went around the corner just in case. I wasn't all the way there. And I, and I put, I put we, what we call tracks. You probably don't know what tracks are. It's like little um, pamphlets, little pieces of paper that talk about Jesus. And that's the way we used to share our faith before, not in these times now, where we can text and call. We used to have these little, what we call, little informations on Jesus, and we used to give it to somebody and say, praise the Lord. So I knew, and then you give it to somebody, and they'll read, have you given your life to Jesus? So through that, people will read about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some, some of you still live in neighborhoods where some people knock on your door at Saturday. Anybody? All right. So I thought I was going to change the world. I'm telling you, I was on fire. And most likely, most people in here feel the same way. When they just got baptized, there is this energy and enthusiasm about Jesus Christ that you believe you can heal everybody, deliver everybody. So sure enough, I went around and what I would do every night Every night turned to three nights, and three nights went to two nights. Two nights turned into one night, and one night turned into no nights. Where that enthusiasm, that fire, because that's what's going to happen. Life somehow always tries to steal your fire. And make you doubt the power of your baptism. And I went through some dark times even after baptism. Clubs, friends, parties. After being baptized. Y'all gonna tell y'all full story? After being baptized. Still. But deep down inside, I knew. There was always a voice saying, you're better than this. You can do better than this. Don't stay in this. And can I tell you, after baptism, please don't turn that voice off. Don't ignore the conviction because that's the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It tells you, don't do that. You know you are better than this. And what we can do, brothers and sisters, is we ignore that voice. You are better than this, and we do whatever we want. Can I tell you, don't turn that voice off. Keep that voice going. And you're talking about more than 30 years. Look where I'm standing today. Yeah. Telling you that there's power in baptism. If you trust God with your life, God will show you amazing things for his glory. I'm, and, and, I, and that's not just for you young folk. This is for the, all age folk. If you trust God. Whenever you feel like your fire is out, you got to know it's still inside of you. It's still, in, it's still inside you, officer, no matter how much life tries to blow out the passion of your baptism, it's still inside of you. Yeah. Somebody say it's inside me. Okay, so, so let's open up the floor for not just my testimony, for, for the, all those testimonies. Can, anybody want to take this time to testify about your post-baptism after you came out of the water? Oh, my God, no, no, not all at once, no. Why, not all at once.
the girls. Yeah. Trust him. Preach it. Amen. Any, any, anyone else? Come on.
Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Don't stop now. Come on. <laughs> you know me. You made me put down my glasses. I was like, well, "Come on, <laughs> let's finish this out." Yeah. 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 Stay on, yes. Yes, Lord. And that's important. Just to, I mean, we'll, we'll continue. I think that's what we hear what we can't do so much and not recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ 
frees us. There's freedom from peer pressure. There's freedom from fear. There's freedom from needing other people's validation. There's freedom from addictions. I, I think oftentimes when we think about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and all the things that we can't do, we look at it as a negative. God is keeping me. And, and his keeping power is saving me from destructive stuff. He's keeping me from the addictions of alcohol, the addictions of pornography, the addictions of, of, of people's opinion, the addictions of peer pressure. He's keeping me from murder. He's keeping me from hurting somebody else. And I think what we often do is we look at Christianity and what we believe as a restriction and not see how much God is saving us from. I'm, I'm not a slave to anything. You know how you can make it through groups that you might be a different opinion from? is because I serve a king. What does your opinion matter when God is on my... Well, my groups of friends, that's what kept me. It didn't work all the time. But if God be for me, That, that's the uh, fear for many of you is going to be fear, low self-esteem, inadequate. When you're young, you're going to have fear about doing things and who you are. You're not going to feel worthy. You're not going to feel smart enough. You're not going to feel good enough. You're going to compare your life to other people. And what keeps you sane and grounded is Jesus. That Holy Spirit says, no, you are more than a conqueror. Yeah, that, that's, and anybody else, anybody else, post, post after you come out of the water. Even uh, being in junior high school, well, high school, I think I was at about 12 at that time. And then um, even as I go through high school and remember, again, I was, you know, uh, around a lot of those groups, those cool friends, and they were doing their own things. And they used to always say, Shemika, you're so boring, and you would be the one that want, don't want to do things. And it was hard, right, because I think I was a cheerleader at the time. And it was like the cool thing was to go out afterwards and hang out with the guys and everybody had multiple sex partners, and I'm going to be transparent because that's what you're going to deal with. They were sleeping around, and I was like, no, a boyfriend, ew. You know, at that time, and, and, and it seemed stupid to them. And they used to mock me all the time. But they didn't know also what I was gr growing up around, drug dealers and, and all sorts of things happening in my house. And I knew, and then when I came to Calvary and I got saved and I got baptized, it was a struggle just, you know, because I had to deal with that criticism. But I knew, you know, who, was I, who I also was around. And it was helpful, what I would say, is that I had the church. And I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, Sister Carlene and um, Sister Chanel does have a strong knit, especially with the young people, but even the older ones, to have that safe space and I know pastors talk about mentors, absolutely. But be also wise that mentors are not perfect. All right? Mentors are not perfect. And sometimes you will look up to someone in the church and have that, and they'll mess up. And sometimes we have that tendency to say, oh, my God, they messed up and they're trying to tell me something. No, that's actually the, the, a good person that can mess up 
admit they messed up, and keep going. So just be careful with that because a lot of times um, people are in church and they may look up to someone and they may see the person fail or they mess up and then they go, you know, oh, look at that. But if the person continues to strive, continues to try, that is still a good mentor. All right? Cause, so be careful with that. And, and that's what I would say because honestly... If, uh, even outside of drugs and all that stuff, people, people, you having that um, stock in people that they can't mess up can also tear you away from God. So that's where I will say where I struggle because in my head I was like, wait a minute. But then as I grow more mature and I grew and I understood that people do make mistakes. We all sin. Still, but we keep trying. So that's all I wanted to share. Anyone else before we wrap up this session and, and uh, we give the announcement of, of next week? Um, come on, sister. Oh. Praise the Lord, everybody. Um, I, what I said was I wasn't going to say anything until Lady Shamika just spoke. But um, my story is different than all of you guys. Uh, I grew up in the church like most of us did. But whenever it was time to get baptized, I never, I wanted to get baptized, but I never understood baptism and when I would hear that baptism was symbolic, I just something in me just knew that it was more than that. And I was never a person who would do something that I didn't know what I was doing. Even now, I am that person. If I don't understand, I wait, you know, unless God is really, I have learned to humble myself. And if God is saying do something now, I do it. But back then, I wasn't like that. I got baptized at 27. At that time, I had, I had my children. I had Chanel when I was 19, actually 18. I turned 19 after I had her. And I had Stefan when I was 24. And when I came back to the Lord, you know, well, actually when I came to the Lord, because even though I used to get saved every Sunday, by Tuesday, Honestly, Lord, you know, maybe Wednesday the latest, I was in a fight with somebody. So I just always, every week, I was asking the Lord to save me because I had no control. I was always fighting, always fighting to the point where my mom was so scared for me. I didn't realize it until I got older that she used to say, Serena, somebody out there is worse than you. And I used to be like, Mommy, I ain't find them yet. So and I, I had a problem. I had a problem, you know. I know that now. No self-control. Anything used to tick me off in, in these hands, you know. But when the Lord, when, I, when he really started to press me and he gave me like this voracious appetite to read the Bible, I know that that was God, you know. And I would read and I would read. I would write the scriptures on on little post-its and they were all around my bedroom. And then like when the wall in my bedroom, I ran out of space. This time I was still living with my mother. I would come down the stairs with the post-its. We're just coming down the stairs with the scriptures. And one day my mom saw me put a scripture on the refrigerator. She was in the kitchen and she looked at me. I just looked away. I pretended like I didn't see her because the enemy made me feel, and it was such a fight for me. I don't know how he's going to trouble you, but he is a liar. What Pastor Stephen said, 
read your Bible and focus on the Lord, you have to know. It's not what you feel. Because the enemy made me feel like nobody was going to believe that I was saved. Everybody knew me that I was just angry and fighting all the time. And nobody was going to believe that I was saved. So I didn't share with my family that wasn't there when I got baptized that I was baptized. Because I was convinced. I allowed the enemy to convince me that nobody was going to believe that I was saved. And after a while, you know, of just keep reading, reading, then the Spirit of the Lord taught me how to fast and just taught me how to believe him. I started opening my mouth. I started telling more of my family. It wasn't really outsiders. It was my family that I was like, these people are not going to believe. I believe the lie of the enemy. And the real reason why I stood up is because in 2021, and I believe there are those of us in here who need to rededicate. Pastor spoke about it. We need to rededicate. And the Lord called me in 2021 to rebaptize. I had never heard about it. I had never heard that people get baptized twice. But as I was speaking to Evangelist Weathers one day about it, she said to me, she said, no, Serena. I got baptized twice also, and so did Minister Codlin. You know, and that the importance of just opening up, like Lady Shamika said, having someone to speak to, someone that you, because even at this age, I was like, Lord, I knew God was telling me to get dipped again. But I was like, okay, it just didn't make sense. But I'm past that. I don't understand. God said, do something, you do it, and you, you get the understanding later. And for those of us who know, you know, and there is nothing wrong. Nobody has to stand up and say, I did this, I did that, I did. But we know that we have gotten. And you know what? It may not even be that you have gotten off the path. Because I'm going to tell you, when the Spirit of the Lord, how he, he explained it to me when I was getting rebaptized, he, he used the marriage analogy. And like people, some people... Like every 10 years, every 15 years, they rededicate. They go to the altar again. I love what you said this morning about baptism is not just a death. It is a marriage. Because for those of us who are not married can understand. Me as a woman, learn to submit to God now that when my husband comes, I have already learned the role of the bride in the marriage. It, it's a powerful, powerful thing that happens when we get baptized. And to the young people, just know whatever, whatever you hear, thank God that you have saved parents that you can go to and share everything with them. Don't allow the enemy to put anything in your mind that is anti to what you hear coming across the pulpit. If it's too heavy for you to carry, tell your mother, come to pastor, come to Lady Shamika, whoever the Lord is telling you to go to, to, to your dad, don't try to fight this by yourself. But like Sister Marissa said, the, the moment we see the freedom and the beauty, the beauty of holiness that I was just telling my son last night, we were driving we went to IHOP and I saw this guy walk past us just drugged out and stumbling. And I said, we don't even realize, we, we, we get upset about we don't have all this money and we don't have all this. I'm not a drug addict. I have some place to sleep at night. Everything that I need, God has provided. Listen to me. And I'm going to tell you, for those of you who, and, and I'm sorry, I did, but I just feel led to share this because we don't know the things that God will do for us. After I got saved, I had these two children. And, you know, I knew that I couldn't be in a relationship with their father like that. Let me tell you, when I told him, this is done, I am saved. The things that this man did for me, paid for me when I went pre-med to go to school, paid his, his, um, Rent in his house, 
rent in our house. My car note, his car note, ain't no funny business going on because I let, and I told him, if you don't do it, God will find somebody else to do it. And the truth is, I didn't ask him. When I was praying to God, he came to me and offered to do it. People will make you think that you have to live a certain way. We don't think the way the world thinks. We don't do things the way the world does them. Trust God. I am a person who prays to God and I wait to see who he's going to send to help me. If I need help externally, if I need extra money, I wait for him to open up the extra shifts, whatever it is. I'm not bending to do how people, well, we got to do it. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter. God don't make sense. Read the Bible. It don't make sense to walk around a wall and the wall fall down. But if we believe these things and from the book, we have to believe them for our own life. He's the same God. Let him be God in our lives. God bless you. All right, so God bless you, everyone that testified. Amen. Th thank God for uh, testimonies. It is what we definitely need um, uh, to keep fu f fueling us. Uh, it's, there is so much power in your testimony and, and that you should never be ashamed. N never be ashamed of telling your story of how and what God did for you. All right? And, and so, again, so to wrap up, Baptism is a command. Jesus commanded his disciples to go baptize. And because of that command, that we are doing baptism out of obedience. Ba baptism is because Jesus was baptized, I am copying what Jesus did. If he was perfect and he got baptized, baptism is copying, being imitators of Christ. Ba baptism is commitment. It doesn't remove sin. It's revealing the commitment of your heart. I'm committed to Christ. I identify with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When you come up from the water, something has changed permanently. I know you may not think so. But when you look in the mirror, your life has changed. That's another C. Another C. I'm purposely doing all the C's so that you, it's the ABCs of baptism. I'm changed. You have been, after baptism, you have been permanently changed. One more time. After baptism, you've been permanently changed. You look the same, but you are not the same. Amen? Next, after you come up from the water, you need community. As our Lady Shamika was saying, as our minister was saying, as our uh, officer was saying, our uh, sister uh, Marissa was saying, you need community. You cannot serve God by yourself. After Jesus was baptized, you know what he did? He got some friends. He got some friends. The Son of God, with all power, needed some friends. You need to get some good friends. Some committed friends. Is that, is that all right? You got, you, you're taking notes? Because many of us, we, we permanently change, but we keep the same people around us. And it's going to be hard because breaking off of that outside of that community is difficult. But, but it is necessary. You need to find like-minded people to feed your faith when you don't have any. Are you with me? And last, consecration, or should I say, you need to study. You have to spend time reading, praying, fasting. Yeah. 
Is that all right? I, I, I do one day. I, there's so much thoughts that go around. I'm going to keep it to myself. Um, our communities, our con, our, uh, how we consecrate. Okay? All right. Amen. So this Saturday at 12 p.m., we'll be at Mount Olive, uh, same place where we had our convention. We'll be there. It's not going to be a long service. It's just the baptism, and then we can speak after. This is why I opened this service up today to have these same kind of, of, of discussions. We're just going to baptize there. It's just a baptism. And then the next, the Sunday after, we can go into uh, testi testimony. We can go into more of, of, of the effects and how we feel and the faith. But it's more that what we want to do is next week, not next week, Saturday, December 16th at 12 p.m will be our baptism. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you. You can take it. Um, thank you so much. All right? Put that in your, schedule that in your, your uh, uh, calendars, December 16th at 12 p.m. Uh, we are working on uh, T-shirts so that you can get baptized in so you don't have to uh, worry about attire too much. They're, you know, they're keepsakes. Hopefully that's something you could keep. Um, in your uh, closet to remember the day you was baptized. Now, again, as our uh, evangelist Brown said, the eunuch, and that's, I think that's uh, Acts 8, verse 36, where he, uh, Philip, the eunuch says, what's stopping you? Here's water. And he says, listen, I want to be baptized. We may have some eunuchs that day that says, you know what, I was baptized before, but the Lord is calling me to be baptized again. It's open. For those of you that might have been contemplating being re-baptized, I am not one that's going to tell you you don't, you don't have to. If you believe that God is doing something new in your life and you want to recommit, amen. All right? So I, I want you to feel comfortable in, in, in that day, if you feel like coming forward and says, Pastor, I want to be rebaptized, amen. Here's water. 